So thank you all for joining on this cold evening. Um, I know it's bad out there, so I do appreciate you showing up here. Um, so my name is Sham. I work for a company called Dassault Systems. So we are the world's largest um, 3D um, CAD design company. CAD stands for Computer Aided Design. So it's basically software that helps you design everything from, from aircraft to, um, to, to furniture to, uh, to clothes. Um, and I've been there for uh, a couple of years to jump into that. This is the topic I'm going to talk about today, financial modeling for product managers. Um, what, what does it mean to do financial modeling in this context? Um, why it is important? I'll go over as a brief example of, of the kind of modeling that I do. Um, I am by no means the expert in this. There's multiple ways of doing it. I was talking to a speaker, uh, to, to an uh, audience member earlier. Um, this is not the kind of modeling that Wall Street does. That's a whole other can of worms, right? This is something different. Um, this is meant for different audiences. It's meant for different needs. So it's a lot less, um, it's, it's a lot less accurate in, in, in some sense, but it's important to do as well. So I'll, I'll talk about that. So who's this guy? Um, senior product manager at, at SolidWorks. I've been there for uh, a couple of years. I was in pre-sales before that. Um, I was with a, with a s uh, small company in Boston that was in the, in the semiconductor space. Um, and I was uh, doing alliance management for two years and I've been almost uh, more than five years now as, as a PM. Um, I've got a master's degree in, in robotics and microsystems. That's basically fancy nerd speak for tiny machines. Um, and I have an MBA from Boston University. So my latest uh, goal for this year is trying to learn to juggle three balls. Um, I, I bought a, a kit on Amazon. It's, it's been sitting on my desk since I bought it. I haven't opened it yet, but the year is still young. Okay, um, so a quick overview about the company I work for just gives you some, some context here. So uh, um, this is the software we have. It's, it's, it's one of a suite of, of different software, but the kind of modeling we do is, is this. If you're designing an automobile, so this is a toy. It's not a real car, but it's a toy. Everything from the drivetrains to the, to the to surfaces, to the ailerons, to the wheels, needs to be designed and modeled somewhere. And we create software to do this, right? So everything from simulation of how drag forces work, the weight on this thing, how do you make this thing? If you want to 3D print it, how do you 3D print it, right? So those kinds of things are, is, are what we do. We're the world leader in this. Founded in 93, we were purchased by Dassault in 97, and that's our website. So if you want to learn more about that, um, you know, that, that's what it is. Now, nothing I'm going to tell you is proprietary or, or rocket science. It is complete common sense. But as Voltaire said, common sense is, is not so common. So um, there's nothing here that, that you wouldn't already figure out saying, hey, this is obvious. Why, why do I need this guy telling me this? But sometimes someone has to tell you what the obvious is before it becomes important to you, right? So, that being said, let's talk about modeling. When I say the word modeling, what do people think of? Yeah. It is not Zoolander, okay? This is not the kind of model I'm talking about. What we're talking about is a very specific definition of the word, and so let's go over what that really means. Um, this is what the Webster defines, um, defines model as. A description or analogy used to help visualize something that cannot be directly observed. Okay, fair enough or a system of postulates, data, and inferences presented as a mathematical description of blah, 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 blah. What the hell, right? <laughs> Great, this is a nice set of words, but what does it really mean? A model is an abstract representation of reality. That's, that's fundamentally what it is. It is an abstraction of the way the world works. It is useful to explain uh, the world, and it's, it, is, it is explanatory. I think I misspelled that word. Uh, no, maybe I did not. And predictive. So it tells you how the world works, okay, and helps you make a prediction about that world. Okay, so that's really what a model is. Whether it's financial or economic or, or, or any kind of model, that's really what it is. Now, if, if, you, if, if you look at the different ways in which the word, the word model is used or applied, there's a lot of stuff out there, right? So we live in a world of models. All of physics, all of science is, is literally a model. It is a way to describe how the universe works. That is really what physics is. Any equation you take, Schrodinger, you know, Einstein, Newton, whatever, it's all a way the world works. Okay, it's, it's, it's describing the way the world works. Art is a model. All art, if you think about it, it's art, poetry, literature, it is a, a, a way to see the world, describe the world. Okay? Your credit score is a model. Someone's put an equation together trying to, 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 to judge how you will behave and boil that down to a number. So that is a model. Of course, you know, things like globes and maps, those are models as well. So 
models exist in multiple contexts. It's not just financial or mathematical. It could be artistic. It could be you know physical models. But that's really what models are. Now, what is common across all these models? Let's let's start with that, and that helps us get to what a financial model really is. Um, they are all representations of the world, real or imagined. That's critical. Okay. They communicate a view of the world from the, from the observer's point of view. They are descriptive, meaning they talk about how the world is. They are prescriptive, meaning they tell you how the world may be in the future, assuming your model is, is good enough. Uh, they are decision-making frameworks. And the last line is the most important. All models, no matter what they are, are inaccurate, incomplete, or biased. Every single one. Okay, even if, if you look at Newton's equations, they are inaccurate when compared to Einstein's. Einstein's are inaccurate when compared to some things in quantum physics. So the point is all models are biased, incomplete, or inaccurate. That does not make them um, not useful. They are still useful, but know that models are by definition incomplete. Okay? They, they, they reflect the, the world view that we have. Now, that being said, what is a financial model? Okay, any questions so far? It's all fluff so far. OK. What's a financial model? An abstract representation of a real-world financial situation. That's really all it is. Okay. Um, whether you're on Wall Street or whether you're or be doing a budget for your home, it's a representation, usually in a spreadsheet, but it could be on a piece of paper as well, of a financial situation and the decisions that go along with that. And I'm a product manager. Why should I care about this crap? It's all financy. That, that's what they hire you know, CFOs to do. This is important. Okay. Um, true. Why should I care about this? But uh, I'll, I'll tell you exactly why. So it doesn't matter how great your product is, and that's the conversation that we were having, if it is not financially viable. OK, let's take an example. And most of you probably know about this. Shale oil, right? So fracking, we've all heard about fracking and, and, and you know, what it does. Uh, if you look at um, oil prices, this is from uh, 14, uh, 2014 to 2019. Oil prices have gone from $100 to 40 some bucks, under $40, up to 80 and back down. Now, if you are a, um, a product manager, let's say, or a manager for an oil company, and it takes you, and you know that different kinds of oils have different costs to extract, OK? So it, it takes me $27 um, to extract a single barrel of oil from offshore in the Middle East, OK? Now, if oil prices are 100 bucks. That's a good deal for me. Okay? It's not worth it for me to dig over here at, at 65 So oil sands, for example, cost $70. It takes me $70 to get a barrel of oil from oil sands. This is only worth it if I can get a price of over 70 bucks. If I'm down here and oil prices are at $40, it makes no sense for me to start digging over here. I still go over here. Okay? So the reason I'm bringing this up is because you need to understand the overall financial context in the costs and the revenues that are attached to your specific product. This is the context of oil, but the same principle applies to pretty much any product. How much does it make, how much does it cost for you to do something? Okay, that means the marketing cost, the development cost, the sales cost, overheads, whatever they may be, how much money do you make? That's important to know. So know what those are. And this is a, a fairly a good example to talk about when it is viable to to, to import oil from another country, and when it's viable to start digging under our own feet over here to get oil from shale sands, OK? OK, so how does a financial model help a product manager? That's really where what we're here to understand. It, in this context, is your product or your business or whatever it is that you're selling. Can it make money? Question number one, most important question. How can it make money? Great, I can make a million dollars. How? How are you going to do this thing? Third. How much money can it make? Is it a million, five, ten, twenty million dollars? I don't know. When can it make money? This quarter, next quarter, next year, five years from now? How much money do I need to make more money? What is it going to cost me to make that thing? Okay. How does the money get distributed? This is an interesting point here. Um, depending on how your, your business is set up, there may be many people who will take a piece of that pie. If you have resellers reselling your product, wholesalers, retailers, upstream, downstream, supply chain folks, your money gets distributed. So at the end of the day, when it comes into your pocket, do you get one cent on the dollar or 10 cents? Or how much do you get? That's important for you to know. Are there better uses for the money that I'm about to invest in the product? Meaning, 
if, if, if I put in a dollar and I get $2 back, or if I can put the same dollar and get $5 back, is that a better deal for me? But if I get that $5 in five years and I get $2 today, maybe I want the $2 today, right? So all these things need to be thought about in some structured framework as a product manager. Because at the bottom of the day, your job as a product manager should not be to focus on the money. That's not your first job. Your first job is launching a good product, making sure that you're satisfying your customer's needs. That being said, you need to be aware of the financial implications of what that means. So going back to these questions, if, if the answer to each of these questions or any of these questions is maybe it's not worth it, it doesn't matter how cool your product is, you're gone, you're dead. Either you, know, you go bankrupt or somebody buys you out or somebody's going to beat you to the punch. So um, this is critically important. Do not focus all your time on, and my advice is that you do not focus all your time on, on optimizing this great financial model that it, at the end of the day is a, is a guide for you. That's all it is. It's just a guide. It's not, it's not the gospel truth. Um, but you should be aware of what, what the implications are of your different decision making uh, frameworks. All right. Um, so um, how many of you have been to business school here? Oh, wow. OK. So you know all the stuff, right? <coughs> It's a waste of time. It's a waste of time. Please don't do this stuff. It's just a waste of time. If you go to B school as, as, as I did, and I thoroughly enjoyed the process, but some of the financial stuff was, was not um, something that I found relevant. So something like the, like the leverage buyout model, option pricing model, the elegant mathematical structures and frameworks, they're beautiful. They work in certain contexts. But should you be doing this stuff? God, no. So this is not what you want. A simple spreadsheet, That's everyone's got Excel or Google spreadsheet or whatever the hell you have in, you know, that you use for your spreadsheet, that is really all you need. And all you're putting in is what does it cost for you to do something, all the best costs that you can estimate, and what the revenues are on the other side. Okay? And with the appropriate assumptions, this is a critically important factor. Your assumptions absolutely matter. Okay? You could assume the wrong thing and show that you're going to make a billion dollars next week. It's clearly nonsense. So your assumptions really inform the model that you create. So be aware of the biases that you bring in when making those assumptions. Okay, that, that's an important thing to remember. Now, John, yes. Could, could you explain more on why we should not be doing all of that? Because if, if it exists in the textbooks, I'm going to make an assumption that it is good. Sure, <laughs> good question. Um, so let me put it this way. Um, if I want to chop down a tree, okay, or a, okay, forget a tree. I want to do some weeding in my garden. Okay, I can use a $2 garden tool or I can use a backhoe. Just because there's a giant tool out there doesn't mean that I should be using it. There are certain contexts where this absolutely makes sense. So if you are buying another company, you need to do an LBO or an, if, you're doing, if you're an IPO, if you're doing an IPO uh, model, right? If you're taking your company public, you're doing a fabulous job with your product, everyone wants to buy this thing. If you want to go IPO, you want to do this. In that context, it makes sense. That's not your job. So there are People who specialize in this, there are, there are, there are quants, what, what they call financial experts, quants, who do this. So Wall Street pretty much survives on, on the options pricing model and, and the LBO model, and all these different things. And in some cases, a DCF model helps, but um, usually in, in my case, I work with my FBA guy. FBA is financial planning analyst, right? So there's a group, there's a budget group within our company, and most companies have one, one person or maybe more that does it. Um, working closely with them to understand some of these things. So you may not do all this thing, but your, your findings will probably feed this at another level within your company, depending on how big your company is. Make sense? Yeah. All right. um, OK, so a simple spreadsheet with the costs on one side, revenues on the other side, and the right assumptions. So um, a few ground rules. And again, these are my rules. These are not Newton's laws of anything. These are just my rules. Assumptions important, OK, depending on how you uh, on how you lay this thing out, you could, you could go one way or the other. So make sure your assumption, uh, assumptions are, are, are as accurate as possible. Um, start with a single unit of time, and this is something that, that I've made a mistake with, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you in a bit why that is a mistake. Um, don't start off complicating things. Uh, start off simple and add complexity as you go along. Because um, the more complex you make your, your model, the, mo the more you get confused. You confuse yourself and you convince yourself of certain things that are not true. So especially with Excel, it is so easy to do all these fancy things. 
you will get lost very quickly. So start off with a single unit of time or a product. So what does it take for me to move a single unit of my product or let's say a single license of my product per month or per year or per quarter or per week or whatever, right? That unit, um, that unit calculation helps you get a context and then you can scale up from there. Okay, so that, that's one thing that, that I've made a mistake in the past um, and my, in fact, my financial analyst at work, my FBA guy said, simplify, simplify, start simple and then do complex. Um, don't add too many variables. Um, this is again something, so I'm an engineer, I like to complicate things, okay? Don't do that, <laughs> keep it simple. Um, again, start with the basic assumptions, one, two, three variables that you know and you, that you can control and then add levels of complexity. And again, I'll, I'll show you a model where I have a complex version of something and a simple version of something and you tell me which one makes sense to you. Um, and this is also important. The model is what matters, not the exact numbers. To some degree, this is true. So, you know, people say um, when you write a business plan, it's not the business plan that matters, but the thought process that goes into it. It's a similar kind of a thing. The business plan is important, yes, but the point is not the business plan. The point is that you've gone through the entire process of, of, of your, your, you've, you've, you've looked at your assumptions, you've looked at, your, at, at how you're gonna make money and all these different things. So the model is important to some degree um, and the number is important to some degree, but don't get stuck up on, on one or the other too much. Okay, all right. I'm gonna open up an example of, of the kind of model that I've done. Um, this is not something that, uh, this is something that, that is unique to my case. It may not be um, something that you do, but, Okay, um, so let me give you some quick context here. So the assumption is that I am launching a new cloud product, okay? This could be, I don't know, um, a, a, a new web browser based tool to design chairs, okay? It could be anything, doesn't really matter. Um, MRR means monthly recurring revenue, so how much money do I make per, this is per unit, per, per single unit. Um, from product A, let's call it product A. What is the cost per month to deliver a product? Okay, I'm just gonna make that zero for now. Okay. Um, now, I've simplified these things considerably. So the cost to deliver something could come from multiple sources. It could be development cost, sales and marketing cost, um, reseller margins, it could be 15 different things. But I'm simplifying it into one, one simple number. And this is the point I'm trying to make. I, can, I could have gone and in the first level and said, okay, the, the R&D cost is you know, blah, the sales cost is blah. It's gonna take me six months to find that out, ask from different people, factor in different information, but it doesn't help me get to where I want. So it's easier to start with, an, with, a, with a catch all number, saying okay, this is the cost of the product, stick it in there, and then as and when you refine your model, add different levels of detail to it, okay? So um, this is, again, cost, revenue. Okay, those are my assumptions, state them clearly. Now, uh, TAM stands for total addressable market. So again, this is uh, product manager speak for how many people can I go and get to buy this thing? That's really all it is. Um, assuming that I'm going after four kinds of customers, right? I'm going after college students, I'm going after engineers, I'm going after entrepreneurs, and I'm going after, after professionals. So these are to some, in, in some way my personas. These are the kind of people I'm going to go after, okay? And this may or may not be accurate in your case, but um, I've, De determined from the, from the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that there's about five million you know, university students worldwide, about a million engineers worldwide, entrepreneurs of 25,000, and about half a million people with home projects. So these are the, the potential number of people I could sell my product to. I'm not saying that I am going to sell to them, I'm saying potentially these are people I could sell to. So about six and a half million people worldwide. Now here's where assumptions kick in. I'm going to assume that I can only sell to 10% of these people. Just because I've got half a million people out there doesn't mean that they're all gonna buy my product. I'm going to assume that only X number of people can buy it. So, you know, just, just to have some fun, let's say each of these people, I'm able to sell 10% uh, or 10% of my TAM is really the people I can service. Now, uh, so that's about, you know, this is 10% of that. Now this is where things get interesting. Now let, let's take a look at this. Now if the cost to deliver a product is $8, Okay, now watch what happened. The whole thing is, is, is dynamic. And this is, it's pretty trivial Excel stuff. It's not magic by any means, but it very quickly helps me understand if I sell this thing, if it costs me to sell, uh, if, if it costs me $1 to sell this product, I'm looking at $7.8 million worth of cost per year. Okay, 
that in itself is gold. Now, let's start playing around a little bit. Uh, okay, that's, uh, I don't think I can, I can hit that many students. Okay, let's, let's start with this. But right now, I've not put any, any revenues in here. I'm not putting any revenue numbers. Let's assume that I can put, I can sell this thing for $2, okay? What do you think is gonna happen here? Are we gonna make money or are we not gonna make money? Okay. Are we sure about that? Now, what happened here? We are only servicing 10% of that group, okay? So the cost to serve all these people is that much, but the, we are only hitting a small number of these people. So what's gonna happen here is if you look at revenues per month, the revenues per month come from only these guys, not from the bigger group. So the numbers tend to get very interesting very quickly. Now what this does for me is, now I can say, crap, students, I'm gonna service 500,000 students, I'm only getting 25,000, uh, about $250,000, but I'm giving them a discount. So this is, I'm, I'm putting a discount in. Let's say students are broke, they got no money, okay? I'm gonna charge them two bucks, but because you're a student, you get 50 cents. That's what you pay me per month. So all of a sudden, students are getting my stuff for free, but engineers have money, so they pay the whole money, they pay $2 for me, and individuals and entrepreneurs are kind of broke, so $1.50 for them, okay? <laughs> That happens. Um, so now I can start playing around with my price numbers or discount numbers. So let's say, okay, two bucks is what I'm gonna charge these guys. And let's say that instead of, uh, instead of giving students um, any discount, say students play full price. Now things are interesting. So watch this, you've got your total cost, $7.8 million in cost, that's the red. Your revenue is $1.2 million. All that's happened is, I've changed my, changed my student discount, okay, from 25% to no discount. And all of a sudden, I'm going from half a million dollars in, in revenue, this is not profit yet, it's still, it's still just revenue, um, to $1.2 million. I pretty much doubled it by taking the discounts away from the students. Now, it, it could turn out that because I've gave these guys, because I'm not giving them a discount, this may go down from 10% to, I don't know, 8%. Okay, so I'm making less money, but it's also less cost. So the point is, once you have a framework with which you can, you can, yes? Your total revenue per year is the same as your revenue per month. That's probably why the numbers are a little off. This is revenue per, uh, into 12, you're right, into 12, thank you. Okay, Ex example, great example of how a model can take you the wrong way. This was not planted. This <laughs> so, great, great point. So this is why once you have a model in place like this, once you start putting numbers in here, you can very quickly start to see how things matter, how you can change things. So um, ad adoption curves, let's say that um, I've got only 10% of my users, I'm gonna keep 10, 10, 10, and you can very quickly start to see how you can start making money on this. Now, like I said, there are many factors, like when can you make money? This does not have any information about timing, okay? So will this be this year, next year, three years, four years, five years from now? I don't know. That's another level of complexity you can put on it. But this right here is very quickly help me understand uh, what I should be pricing my product at or what I can price my, not should be, what I can price my product at, okay? I may, I may say, look, I'm gonna charge five, five dollars for this thing, which is fine, may, these, these numbers may change, adoption rates may change, may go up, may go down, that's fine, but you can very quickly see at what point you're gonna make money on this thing. Uh, again, this is not something you should be, uh, you shouldn't take this to your CEO and say, look, give me my money to sell my product because I'm gonna make, no, this is not the point. The point is when you create your product, so I do a lot of pricing at work. So when I launch my product, one of the things I need to understand is how do I price this thing, okay? Relative to what the competition is doing, relative to what my customer's willingness to pay is, the price sensitivity, different, different, different things like that. So this very quickly lets, lets me uh, look at my solution space, an engineering term, solution space of where I, what my top and bottom ranges are, okay? Now, I'll show you an example of how to complicate this and get things, um, I know, wrong. So, uh, I'm gonna show you the first model I created. 
which was which was something I'm just going to zoom out to show you how complex things can get. Uh, this was epic fail. Um, and the reason, the reason was not because the logic was not sound. It was too complex. Because what I was doing was I did year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. I'm projecting five years into the future with a whole bunch of assumptions. I've got uh, the way I'm looking at this is I'm, I'm selling to existing customers and to new customers. And the new customers drop off at a certain rate. You know, a whole bunch of different things. Too many variables. Too many variables. So my number showed me I'm going to make $2.2 .2 billion in in five years, which wasn't too far from the truth, but um, it took me a lot of unnecessary pain to get to this point. The best way that I figured out to do this is, again, starting off with this. And if you feel that this requires more detail, then you start digging. And you may say, fine. Um, like I said, in, from the cost perspective, I've got five different cost lines, or four different cost lines, whatever. Um, and they start listing them out. Then you can see, OK, can I cut costs in here? Does it make sense to cut costs over here? And that's not your decision to cut a cost. This is a, a recommendation. So the point of all of this is once you're done with your model, once you're done with your a model, um, so what? A, again, a model is simply a means to communicate. It's not the truth in itself. It's simply a means to communicate your, your view of the world to somebody that is a decision maker. Sometimes that is you, sometimes it's your boss, sometimes it's your boss's boss. Um, so you've got your model, fine, no, so what? Communicate clearly, please. Uh, and I am absolutely guilty of this. Um, I get excited with my, with my Excel spreadsheets a lot. Um, I'm sure some of you do as well. Um, senior execs don't care about your mathematical masterpiece. They simply don't. So you could create a beautiful you know, uh, mathematical model of, of how things go by time and put macros and all that good stuff, which is fine. You, know, you can get yourself happy with that. But they don't have the time or the patience for that. They, are, they need decisions. They need recommendations. So what, the way to communicate that is um, frame your findings as an if-then statement. Okay? This is what I, I, I find um, gets senior execs, at least where I work, um, you know, gets them to, to take action. So example is. If we increase price by 10%, then we make additional million dollars a year. Okay? Something like that. So you're, you're, you're telling them the action that needs to be taken, okay? your recommendation of what you should be doing, and the result of that action. Now, this is just one line. Typically, you want to provide three or four or five or multiple options, saying if we increase price by 10%, then this happens. If we, if we I don't know. Um, change our uh, channel reseller margin by 3%, that happens. So you don't give them one solution. You're giving them a range of options from which they can choose. Um, the advantage of, of doing this, and there's, there's one other piece that I need to mention here, is um, like I said, with, with, any, with any model, um, this is not the way that, the, so the world is not obliged to follow your model. So just because you put something on a spreadsheet doesn't mean that this is what is going to happen. Okay, and any smart person knows that, and execs absolutely should know this. It's just because you said the price goes up by ten percent, and next quarter if you don't get a million dollars, you know you you won't lose your job. That's the point. So again, these are just ways in which you can you can you can help your your managers make decisions. Use probabilities whenever possible. Um, what I mean by that is um, just playing off the earlier point. If you increase price by ten percent, we make there's about a fifty percent chance that we make. A million dollars a year. Okay, so that way you're kind of, you know, making sure that you you communicate your uncertainty as well, because this statement right here, then we will make an additional. That's a certainty. This is one way to put it, but it could be misinterpreted. A nicer way to do it is if we increase price by 10 percent, then there's a 50 percent chance we will make a million dollars or more that year. So that gives you some leeway as well, and that's the honest truth. That really is the way the world works. Um, and like I said, what is the best case and worst case scenario? So if such and such a thing happens, what is the worst case? You, 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 may, you may lose $5 million. Okay? If such and such a thing happens, you'll make $5 million. So that's your space. You, that's your space. And you operate within that space. And again, this space is a probability space. It's not that this is you know, zero and that's infinity. This is your probability space. You're working inside that. 
Um, this is a good way to, 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 to communicate your, your thoughts, your findings to management because those guys are, or girls are under pressure as well, or women, excuse me, are un, under pressure as well. Um, they need guidance as much as we need guidance. The final point on this slide is um, offer a recommendation on how to proceed. So everybody is, is, is working with limited information. Everybody. We are, our bosses are, their bosses are, everybody is. So providing a recommendation based on your understanding of the world, you know, Mr. CEO, Ms. CEO, this is what I recommend you do. Uh, I find that they really appreciate that. Um, not that they will follow what you say, but at least, you know, they are aware that, look, this recommendation is based off of such and such analysis. I trust this person. Maybe it's worth considering. So a recommendation is something that, um, that, 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 that senior management, I found, really um, likes to hear. So um, in, in summary, um, keep it simple. You can get complex. Do that by all means, but don't do that on day one. Uh, know and state your assumptions clearly. I mentioned this in, in, in my slides as well. In my slides, I had simply two assumptions, my cost and my um, uh, and, and my revenue, and if, I guess uh, the, the, the uptake percent or 10 percent of people will take this part. So that was an assumption. That can be tweaked, but state those clearly. Um, don't use fancy mathematics and complex models unless you're in, in, in finance. Don't do that. Um, the most complex things you should be doing is probably an average and a, and a, disc, and a, and a, and a let's say, a discount percentage. That's pretty much all you should be using, percentages and, and averages. Um, clearly communicate impact, impact, very good word, impact. What does it mean if you do certain things? Communicate that to your decision makers. Um, get input from multiple, multiple stakeholders, like what just happened here. He caught a mistake in, in my slides. Very, very, very important to work with multiple stakeholders, including sales, including management, including you know pretty much everybody who has a stake in the game. In some cases, customers. It may be important to talk to your customers to say, hey, Mr. Customer, this is the, the, the range that we, we think we, the value of a product is to you, you know, and based on their feedback, how do you, fe you know, feature that in? So uh, stakeholders, very important. And this is, I think, the most important line in this entire presentation is the universe is not obliged to conform to your spreadsheet. Just because you put something on a spreadsheet doesn't mean that the world will work this way. It is a guess. It is a model. It is your best guess. Um, and and unlike in things like corporate finance, there's no right answer here. You're working in a very fuzzy region. The, the best answer you could get is maybe uh, go, no go on should you invest here or should you not invest here, or should you make the product or not make the product. Um, if you choose to make you know, X dollars, you could price it at one. If you choose to make Y dollars, you could price it at two. So depending on what your business objectives are, how much money you need to bring into the company, how much, uh, you know, um, how much does how much is is your bonus depending on it? Whatever reasons, whatever incentives you have, that's really what what drives this. Uh, the world may may change in ways that you cannot control, and um, those are things you simply cannot model. So that's an important thing for you to remember. But overall, I um, think a quick summary of of the way I do modeling. This is one way to look at the world, and for me, I find it. Uh, useful because in addition to the normal product management roles of you know customer talks, um, you know in interviewing people, uh, prioritization, feature requests, all that gets done. But it's it's stuff like this that gets you to the next level as a business leader. If you see yourself as starting a business, owning a business, running a business, even within your organization, running a, a business unit, uh, this is the kind of things you have to start doing. Is not just feature level stuff, which is important, but move up one level, two levels, just look at the lay of the land, and this is what gets you noticed um, in growing your career as well.